Hello everybody, thank you for joining me. This is Game God Fluent. One second, bringing you episode two of Let's Play Grimoire, Heralds of the Winged Exemplar, second half of the manual episode. So we're going to get right into it. We're at resistances. So if you hold down the encumbrance icon on the character plate to see that character's resistance is displayed on a graph between 0 and 100, with 100 being the maximum resistance any character can have to certain types of magic or attacks. Um, if the dot is replaced by a plus or minus, that means the resistance is currently enhanced or diminished by that type of modifier. So there's item resistance, magic resistance, condition resistance, sun sickness... Um, and it shows your resistance to all those things. So then there's conditions. Hold down the conditions icon in the character plate to see how conditions currently afflicting this character. Range between 0 and 100, with 100 being the maximum amount the character can accumulate of that condition. A majority of conditions will wear off on their own with rest by the party, but the ones that don't can get quite serious if not attended and cured as early as possible. Excuse me. So... This is important. This is the operation panel button here. There are two different ways to select an action for a character from the operation control. The first is to use the little arrows beneath, the little flipper buttons, to flip to the action you want the character to perform and then press that operation control icon. A shortcut method is to right click with the mouse cursor on the operation control and select the action you want to perform from the pop-up menu. So here is the pop-up menu. There's auto heal. When the action begins, the character will attempt to use whatever healing spells they have to heal all damage currently sustained by the party. Concentrating on the most injured first, they will cast healing spells over and over again until they either heal all the injured members of the party or they run out of magic. You can interrupt them by clicking on their viewport or narrative window or pushing the escape key. There's look. If you click this icon while the mouse is empty, the party character will conduct a search of the current cell looking for secrets or anything that is concealed. This will reveal hidden things on the cell you might not otherwise find at all. If you click on the look icon whilst holding an item in the mouse, you will see the description of that item appear in a window over the viewport. The mouse item must be identified before you can view this description. Assay. When you click this icon, you can identify items and assay their properties. You can click this with no item in the mouse and be prompted to choose an item or click the icon with an item in the mouse and go to the assay panel. Their spell, clicking this icon will display the spell book for the character, permitting them to select a spell with a power level and then cast it. Some characters may not have any spells or not reach a spell casting level yet. There's a use command. If you click on this icon empty handed, you'll be prompted to click on an item in your inventory bar. You can hit the escape key if you can't make up your mind. If you also click on the use icon while holding the item, an item with the mouse, it is the equivalent of holding the item while that party character uses it. This can make a big difference in certain contexts. At some point you suspect you shouldn't use an item, but you don't see anything to click on with it, and it doesn't seem to do anything from the inventory bar. Try holding in the mouse while you click on a given character's use icon. Sometime how and who can make a difference when playing the game and using the item at the correct place. You can pick lock. Clicking this icon when you're facing a locked door, the front of a locked chest will display one of the lock picking windows, which are special interfaces that allow you to pick the lock and open it. And there's Equip. Clicking this icon will bring up the Equip window for this character. You can also use shortcuts like clicking on the primary or alternate hand to quickly jump into the Equip interface for this party member. So those are the things you can do outside of combat as well. So for equipment, pretty basic stuff. There are 10 slots you can add or remove equipment to the focus character. Dropping an item on any slot will automatically put it into the correct slot if your character can equip that item. An armor class dummy in the middle of the screen will show you what parts of your character are currently protected, green, and what parts lack armor, red. Um, basic stuff. The large orb to the right of the armor class, this, shows the current encumbrance on this character in the form of a percentage and a spiral ratio inside the globe that increases or decreases as the equipment load on the character changes. Make sure they're not over-encumbered. Over -encumbered. So you get your basic slots, head, arms, upper, lower, feet, prime, primary weapon, alternate weapon, ring, adorn, some form of jewelry or, jewelry or adornment can be worn here, and a quill where ammunition goes. The effect of items that can be equipped to characters, they can be cursed, they can recharge a stat, they can drain, enhance attribute, enhance skill, enhance resistant, equip magic. 
self recharging a say panel okay so if you click the assay action with something in the mouse, you'll be prompt prompted to select an item on the inventory bar to attempt to identify with the character given their assaying skill. You'll get a confirmation message in the narrative window with the name of the item if your character succeeds in identifying it or if they failed to figure out what it was. Many items feature additional skills that can assist in identification. For example, many reagents and herbal ingredients add the nature lore skill to the assaying skill to determine if the character can identify it. In addition, a party character receives an assistance from an identify or improved identify spell in this effect that is an effect at higher levels of improved identify you will not only be able to identify the item but a special super identify text will be entered into your journal about the item super identified items will then feature enhanced information in the essay panel as well as matching entry in your journal this information will be available for the rest of the game and the item will never have to be identified again so there's a super id The assay panel displays all the most pertinent information about the item, including the relevant weight, cost, skill, equip slot, item class, races, and professions who can equip the item, where the item was acquired at, and special information about the combat use properties of the item. Once an item has been super identified, you can click this panel while inside its borders and see the display flip to another page of extended information about the item. Level advancement hints. Normally the button on the party character plate that is labeled item workshop will bring up the inventory workshop with that character having the, the focus for crafting. We know that. There's an exception to this display and it occurs when the character still has remaining work to do as a result of that character's advancement or else spare points left over from character creation. These special icons simply exist as a reminder to the player that this particular character still has points to distribute for attributes or skills or else remaining magic spells to add to their spellbook. If the button is clicked while one of these special icons is showing, it instead takes the player into the character review so they can remedy the situation by taking care of this remaining business. The following icons are used to indicate to the player what sort of work is still outstanding for this character. So the letter L with a tiny A plus in the corner, the character still has bonus points for attributes. L with an M in the corner, the character still has magic spells remaining. L with an S plus in the corner, the character still has bonus points for skills. And once, that, once you've done that, it returns to the item workshop. Spellbook. Um, a spellbook has 12 pages, and each page is concerned with a certain category of ma magic. Um, pretty basic spell stuff here. These are the different type schools of magic. These are the spells. We'll learn about power level, I guess. Not here, though. But power level just rolls more die. Um, but also uses more of your magic. Lock picking. Um, this is a little tricky. Many locks respond to keys and can't be opened without an incident if you happen to be carrying the right one. There are other keys like the ubiquitous locksmith key that can be found commonly anywhere which surprisingly turn out to open even the toughest lock without injury, injury to the party. In those cases where you want inside the chest but have no adequate thieving skills, there's a spell known as knock knock. We're familiar with that. If your, thinks think, if your thief thinks he is able enough, most, most locks can be quick. Bah. picked quite readily with sufficient skill in both inspection and lock picking or a very high skill in either the inspection skill assists in examining and understanding the parts of the lock and the lock picking skill is what you actually use to trick the lock open without incident um, they come with traps of all varieties the traps growing more deadly as the lock becomes higher level if you're tampering with the lock disturbs the trigger used to detect someone attempting to pilfer it the trap can go off without much warning and result in one or more of your party members becoming sick injured or even killed by the trap for this reason it benefits a delicate touch and a bit of reasoning to disarm the trap and open the lock in order to reduce the damage of the trap spontaneously detonate and to assist with lock picking the party can use spells like trap glue and magic moth to hold the trap steadier while it's examined and to reveal its workings 
Doors are a little easier than chests, and chests can become very hard at the highest level. A reckless party can simply pop open the chest, absorb the penalty, perform some first aid on the party members affected, and thus acquire the contents without much finesse. At lower levels, this is a very unwise approach to locked items and will often result in many unnecessary deaths in party members or serious injury that requires healing magic to remedy. So, chests. Chests can be found stuck into alcoves and walls as well as just sitting out in the open. Um, picking them. The lock consists of two set of wires connected to one another secretly on both sides of the lock. The connections between the wires are either side are not obvious. They are concealed when the lock is first examined. The goal in lock picking is to carefully pluck at the wires on either side to determine which wires are connected to which and then cut them in order one at a time. It sounds difficult at first, but with a bit of practice, your thief will be popping over chests safe safely with ease. Once you have safely cut the wires connected to each other in the correct sequence, and hopefully with a minimum of errors that might trigger the trap, you can then click the open button to reap your reward. The name tag of the party member who's working on the lock will be highlighted to remind you of the skill levels of the character that are being deployed against the lock mechanism. Each time you give a little touch on either of the mysterious wire buttons on either side of the trap, you will see the number appear as a result of successful use of that character's inspection skill. You will see it change to red, signified failed attempts at identifying the wire. Your lockpicking skill determines if your fa failure to identify the wire sequence, sequence number will then trigger a red star in the box at the bottom of the lockpick window. If you lose all your stars at the bottom, the margin of error, the trap will instantly go off. Sometimes if your lockpicking skill is low, the trap will spontaneously go off from a single wrong move. So we're going to have to play with that, obviously. Your lockpicking skill determines whether you will set off a trap and how likely it is to go off while matching the wires up to each other. If your inspection skill is low but lockpicking is high, a better strategy would be to connect the wires directly since the trap is less likely to go off. If your inspection skill is high but lockpicking skill is low, reveal the numbers first and disconnect the wires. Either way, if you have successfully cut all the wires, push the open button to pop open the chest and find out what's inside. doors. Unlike chest, doors can be opened with sufficient brute force by posting strong enough party members together as a team to push on the door. Even easier doors will require at least two party members pushing on it to force it open. Your best bet is to assign your thug classes like Saurians, Drakes, and Giants to push on the door. They will nearly always yield good results if they are fresh and rested. When using this tactic, the greatest assets will be the strength and vitality of the party member assigned to push on the door. If this is all bull in the china shop approach is not your party style, you can draw upon the finesse of thieves to gain entry to doors that are locked, and you will not risk jamming the lock as you can do while using brute force to shove the door open. Of course, there are some doors, doors so impregnable that, impregnable that a thief could not open them or even the strongest muscles could not budge them open. These situations will always require a key or else the door will remain locked until you, to you until you find it. The easiest way to check these kinds of doors is to click on them to see if you get a message this door cannot be opened by any other way but with the key intended for it. Forcing a door. If your party pushes against a forced locked door three times in a row, you'll get the forced interface for the door. This allows two party members to try to use brute strength to force the doors open, pushing on either sides of the door. You will have to click the box at, the, at left or right, then select who to pick who will occupy that slot when pushing the door. Okay. You can press the escape key at any time if you change your mind or decide you don't want to try to force the door, including when you've been prompted for who you want to pick for each slot on the left and right. Once you've decided who will push against the door, you are ready to make the attempt by pressing the big double arrow button in the middle of the dialogue. Each time you make the attempt, you'll get a message of whether or not you succeeded or failed, and you will be told if you came close but didn't quite manage to force it open. Each time you press the double arrow button to make the attempt, your characters doing the pushing will get progressively more exhausted. When they are too tired to push against the door any longer, the slot will be cleared and they will no longer be participating. At this time, you can replace one or both characters with other party members to make the attempt all over again. If you have tried with everybody in your party and have all been unsuccessful, it's possible that the characters in your party are just not strong enough to force the door open. You can always come back when you're rested up and recovered your strength or when you're in better shape to make the attempt again. Attempting to force the door successive times without unlocking it can eventually result in the door being jammed, which means you can no longer force it open. 
You should always be able to pick the lock on the door no matter what happens, but once the door is jammed, it cannot be forced open in another attempt, meaning you'll have to successfully pick the lock or open the door to open the door after it's been jammed. For this reason, it can be wiser to attempt to pick a lock first, since that is much likely to be jammed by attempting to pick it. Only force the door when you have a high degree of confidence that the combined strength of two of your party members will be sufficient to force it open. Interesting stuff. Picking door locks. When encountering a locked door anywhere in the game, you'll get the option to pick that lock if you go to the operation icon for a character who has lock picking skill and click on the lock pick icon standing in front of the door facing the lock. The interface windows appear beneath the viewport and will consist of a riddle carved into the wood of the door which will have a matching answer below. The goal of lock picking a door is to figure out what the answer is, spell it out by clicking the correct letters below the riddle and then click open to see if the door will unlock. Each time you click on any of the letters, even if it is unidentified with the question mark, it will be revealed at that time by clicking it. As your skills in inspection and lockpicking increase, you will see more letters revealed on the lock at the start. The possible letters in the answer are displayed in the middle of the interface panel. Some of the letters will be revealed given the skill of the party member picking the lock. Others will be concealed. If you select a letter that is not the answer, you run the risk of setting off the lock trap. If you do not instantly set off the trap when entering an incorrect letter, you may incur a penalty star in the window of stars below. Even if your lock picking skill is sufficient that your errors do not instantly set off the trap, once you've used up all your penalty stars, the trap will be activated automatically if it exists. The door lock is different from the chest lock in that the door remains locked even if the trap is set off. A good rule of thumb is to look at the riddle and then look at the letters possible in the answer and try to eliminate the letters that are definitely not the right ones to give you a hint of what the correct answer to the riddle might be. If at any time you decide the door is too tough for you or you'd like to try again some other time, you can always back out by clicking the abort button. <clears throat> okay, so down on the viewport panel, um, the combat gauge will appear over the Grimoire logo, su logo summary to signal you're now in a fight or flight mode. The combat gauge is a skull with two opposed axes that display your partals party's total hit points in green on the left and total hit points of your opponents on the right in red it has three buttons on it battle review and end game um the only other kind of encounter you have in grimoires with npcs which in that instance you'll see the relationship bar appear on the grimoire logo summary normally appears this bar appears as two drama masks one smiling on the left on the and other on the right frowning representing the amity green dot and enmity red dot the npc has towards you an encounter with a hostile NPC can eventually lead to a battle at which time you'll see the combat gauge appear in place of the relationship bar, but it generally means you'll be entering into negotiation, conversation, and interaction with the NPC before there's any fighting. There's no need to assume that any encounter with an NPC has to end in combat. If you learn to conduct yourself well in these instances, you will find you may never have to fight an NPC unless they initiate hostilities against you. And you see a bribe option there. Combat. Um, turn-based, limited to four rows of monsters in any encounter. Point of combat is to win. There is a spell that can help you determine where the monsters be wait be may be waiting called Danger Sense. If you can find it, the spell will show you the locations on the map where you can expect a battle <coughs> Excuse me, with some as yet unknown opponents. The worst encounters can come when you're surprised by wandering monsters while the party's resting. Grimoire will nearly always have a weakness by design that can be found in every single monster or creature you encounter in the game. Trying several different strategies in combat is the best approach when encountering a monster for the first time. As soon as you can see a certain type of magic is working against the monster, try more of it. With a bit of practice and a few lost battles, you soon find you'll be able, more than able to cope with most of the monsters and creatures you encounter in Grimoire. Unlike other games, nobody's going to hold your hand and tell you how to win in combat, what strategy to use, or what the simplest and most expedient exploits are. You have to figure those out yourself by playing and losing, thinking a bit about your tactics, and then trying again. It is ex to be expected you will learn some painful lessons early on until you get the hang of it and learn how to emerge victorious. The unique charm of Grimoire is that it instead of apologetics, it expected you will grow and develop as a player despite it being quite challenging when you play the game the first time. 
battle. Mm-mm. Pressing the review button will bring up the combat orders. We know about that. Um, when you're pleased with your strategic plans for the impending conflict, you push the button on the screen later labeled battle in order to start the fight and see how it plays out one step at a time. Assigning orders. So here are your orders. You can click um, the operation control to use in combat. There's fight. Clicking this icon is attempting to give an order to attack with equipped primary or alternate weapons you may be carrying. You may be prompted for the attack type if more than one attack type for your weapon exists. If you're using a ranged weapon that can reach further than one row, you'll be prompted to select the row of monster you'd like to attack, sometimes for both weapons. Note that an equipped item that has a use attack type mode available will be automatically be used in battle with this combat order. There's use where you're prompted to pick an item in your inventory bar you'd like to use in the combat round when the time comes to execute the order. Pick an item that looks like a good bet to be effective when used against the monster. Shield, another party member who is in the same row that you are. This means that the party member is attacked in combat that you will have a chance to deflect it based on your character's shield skill. This can be a good strategy to protect spellcasters while they perform their incantations to make sure monsters don't interrupt them by attacking them. There's an equip button. There's a spell button. We'll bring up the spell book for the character, and if they have acquired any spells, you can pick one from their book, select a power level for that spell, and click cast. Depending on the kind of spell the character has chosen, this may further be prompted to pick a fellow party member, a row of monsters, or an item as the target. Um, when your party has had enough and decided it's time for strategic withdrawal, this means that the character will attempt to start running as soon as the combat round action comes up, and if he succeeds, he will lead the entire party into a full-scale retreat from combat. Some encounters this will not work at all, but it can come in handy when your party realizes they are definitely doomed if they stay and fight this battle. <clears throat> There's the hide icon. It means the character is going to attempt to hide during the combat and vanish into the shadows. If they are successful and manage to make it into hiding, the hidden condition will appear on their character conditions icon. This means that they'll be able to attack from the shadows and do double or even triple damage to opponents depending on their backstabbing skills. Then there's special. Many of your characters will often have special abilities or breath weapons unique to their class or race. For example, the most common is the Berserk mode for Berserkers. When you click this icon, you are giving them a combat order to use this power during the next combat round. If they have more than one special ability, you may be prompted to select which one you want to use from a pop-up menu. If their special ability can be used to target a certain group of enemies, you may be further prompted with another pop-up menu to pick the row you want to target. Special abilities are governed by a wide variety of skills, and the character's success when using the ability may depend on their requisite prowess with that applicable skill. So, Combat Orders just gives you a review if you're satisfied with it. You can click each party member in here, and it will highlight their name tag, so you can go and change their orders if you want. Um, attack Type. This is pretty interesting. There are different styles of attack that can be used with various weapons, and there are attack types you are prompted for when you click the fight icon upon entering combat orders. Each type of attack has advantages and disadvantages depending on what row you are targeting in the monsters. Depending on the leverage that the character has when aiming at that row, the range to swing and the power they can deliver, they can have a bonus or penalty applied to that attempt. The modifiers are of two types, a modifier when attempting to hit a monster, and after a successful hit, another modifier applied to attempt to penetrate that monster's natural or supplemental armor. When the character successfully hits and penetrates the monster, the weapon's damage is applied. So there's bludgeon, which is easy to hit monsters near the front of the row, so you get a plus 10 in the front row. Pierce, difficult to aim a spear through several ro rows towards the back, you get a negative modifier. Swing, easy to swing wide and hit monsters up front, gets harder towards the back. Lash, very easy to aim a whip at the front row. Throw, harder to hit the further you have to throw something, you take a negative. Shoot, harder to shoot at a target the farther it is away. And Berserk, swinging wildly, it's easy to hit monsters close to the front, but not at the back. <clears throat> and then to penetrate... Um, Gets more difficult to deliver force the further away the monster is. You get a negative of penetrate. Pierce is likely to penetrate the monster when they are closer. You get a little plus to the first two rows. 
slash, not much difference when slashing a weapon on any row if it hits. Lash, a whipping lash gets weaker further away from the front row. Throw, much easier to do damage with a throw into the front ranks. And shoot, anything shot from a weapon carries greater force when it hits, so you get actually plus into row 4. So we're going to be doing a lot of bludgeon, slashing, maybe lashing, shooting, and then berserk. Wild fighting continues to be most effective on front ranks when doing damage. Cloud spells are a special type of spell that can be cast only in combat. These spells start out at full strength and they're initially cast and they persist on their target, waning each round in strength until they dissipate or are cleared with counter spells by opponents. The most common spell used to clear spout cloud spells on the party is the Purify Air spell, which tries to completely banish the cloud effects or else reduce their duration and strength. The following spells are cloud spells which can be cast by anybody either through their spellbook or with specially enchanted rods, scrolls, or magic items. Acid Cloud, Death Cloud, Destroyer Vortex, Drain Cloud, Earthquake, Equinox, Firestorm, Fog of Frost, Hailstorm, Healing Cloud, Hurricane, In Insect Swarm, Revealer Mist, Stinking Cloud, Toxic Vapors, Summoning. Monsters can be summoned to fight on the party's behalf a variety of spell through a variety of spells and enchantments. Summoned monsters will appear as red outlined figures in the viewport, which are assigned to be fighting in the front ranks by your side. They'll be allied to you and will fight until they're killed or else combat ends in victory. Um, the best part about it is that by fighting by the, on the front rank, they can take a lot of damage meant for your party members and dish it out to the enemy as well. This keeps your opponents busy warring with the summoned monster while you prepare your own attacks. Amongst the illusionary spells, all the monsters are tested for their intelligence and wisdom to see if they actually believe the monster they see is real. If the majority of enemies believe the creature they are seeing is real, it's for all purposes and intents real to them and can kill them as surely as any other opponent. Here are some of the spells that can be used. Phantasm, Vivogenesis, Summon Elemental, Illusion, Summon Hellspawn, Summon Undead, Summoning 1 and 2. Conclusion, you'll get a death screen if you lose... You may be, after the battle ends of victory, you may be prompted with an inventory box that contains the weapons you lost during the battle, including proficiencies you threw or lost to thieving monsters, in addition to treasure dropped by the enemy when they were defeated. You're granted XP for each battle. That's equally distributed. And you'll often see message when you've won informing you that some of your party members increase their skills. Every combat that ends of victory is a good fight, and every good fight contributes to your party character advancement and improvement over their last battle. NPCs. When the NPC has more green than red dots on their bar, they can generally be judge friendly. If the red dots outnumber the green dots, it's a safe bet to assume they're feeling hostile. When both of them are higher or equal, the NPC is feeling somewhat ambiguous and volatile about the party and can change moods quite suddenly. The biggest problem with killing any NPC is that they have friends and acquaintances who will be well aware when you murder them and respond to you accordingly. For this reason, it is wise even if you don't see the moral dilemma to attempt to get along with all NPCs you run into and negotiate with them whenever possible. NPC tends to regard you well because of your behavior towards them in encounters they are likely to pass on a good impression of you to others they are related to. A lot of goodwill in the game about your party will produce unusual options that would never be possible to players who simply kill, steal, and cheat every NPC they bump into. It is good to keep this in mind. Your reputation precedes you in Grimoire even with characters you have not yet encountered. So this might be a three-part episode. We're already at a half hour. But, um... There are special icons in the operation control specific to NPC encounters. There's talk. A player can type sentences to interact with the MP in natural English. There's buy. If the NPC is a merchant, they'll bring up a merchandise list that the party can purchase items from. Most, most NPCs will try to assay items in their shops for you if they know what they are. The barter skill determines what price ranges can be expected on the NPC's wares. You can sell, also determined by barter. Use. It's possible to use an item off your inventory bar while interacting with an NPC, perhaps to encant a scroll or use a ring that might help you in getting an NPC to cooperate more readily with you. You can cast a spell that would assist you. 
Heal NPC. If you suspect an NPC may be wounded or nursing an injury, try healing the NPC with the appropriate skilled character by clicking this icon. You may want to use this more than once to restore an NPC to health if their wounds are serious. You can steal, and if you get caught, they will resent you, but casting a spell like Charm can make them a little less judgmental in the event you get caught. Casting a spell like Charm first before the attempt. Recruit. Clicking this icon will attempt to get the NPC to join your party as a permanent member. This is called hiring a retainer in classic fantasy role-playing games. Some NPCs will charge you a set fee for their company each time the party awakens from a rest in order to remain. Many NPCs will refuse to join you because the recruiter does not have enough high enough fellowship or they lack certain qualities they look for in an employer. In this instance, you can try again with another party member if you suspect that may be the case. Conversation. Um, occasionally you need to loosen their tongues with the charm spell or even cast a text secret. If all this fails, you can try to bribe them. Um, some standard rep repartee is guaranteed to make a good conversation over with any NPC in Grimoire, such as who are you? You type these. What do you do? Why are you here? What is subject? How do I know about subject? Or what do you know about subject? How do I subject? When you reach an impasse or not sure how to proceed, try casting a mind read spell. Higher levels of the mind read spell reveal more obscure words on the NPC's mind they may be concealing to you. Then just hit buy, quit, then just type exit, buy, quit, or press escape to exit. Showing giving items. You can simply grab the item off the inventory bar and present it to the NPC at any time to see what reaction you get. If it is an item they are looking for, or it is part of a quest you have agreed to, this is the simplest way to turn it over to them. Pick it up with the mouse cursor and then click on the viewport with the item to present it to them. If the NPC is feeling friendly towards you, they may give you a detailed description of the item without taking it from you. This voluntary saying that many NPCs can provide can be exploited to get help identifying items that may be very tough at you at present to assay with your own party members. Interesting. Parlay. Dip diplomacy can become a very important skill in these situations for placating an angry NPC or consisting them that the party presents no threat to them and is worth continuing to interact with. Given sufficient time, almost any angry NPC will eventually cool off and forget about their animosity towards the player. Using parlay, you may be able to speed up the natural alleviation of hostility. It's a form of mediation where they may be considered attacking you or exiting without being willing to talk to you reasonably. If they are in this agitated state upon encountering them, you will get an opportunity to negotiate with them, offer them a bribe, cast a spell to enhance your ability to conduce them into a more amicable state of mind or perhaps charm them into submission. If you have an item which may be some help, you can also use it in this mode or offer it to them to see if they're willing to accept it. If all else fails, you may be able to steal from them or just abandon diplomacy and turn directly to force to threaten them into speaking with you. If you are skillful enough, you may be able to placate even the angriest NPCs using a combination of approaches. Some NPCs will respond subtly and others you will find an appeal to their greed will be more successful. Some of them may even respond to careful and tactical diplomatic negotiation by a member of your party who is adept in this regard. Very cool. Role playing system. Hit points, vitality, and magic points are capped at 999. The spirit is always set to 100. Most attributes cap based on the number 100, but attributes and skills have ways to effectively raise them to 120 with magical modifiers. Party characters can expect to begin to reach level 10 in the game, and with a lot of grinding, perhaps even higher levels, there is privileged access to character advancement by purchasing the level in gold instead of experience points available at shrines. By combining experience points and purchases of level increases, some elite players may raise their character levels to much more than 10. So it seems that the level is only 10. That's interesting. Now we get into the races, of which there were 14 or 15, 14, I think. Oh, I'm going to light a cigarette, and I think this is a good place to let off. Um, we're on page 119, so we've got races next. 
um, some tables, spells, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to say thank you for joining me. It's not going to be two videos as I thought. It's probably going to be three, but hopefully no more than three. Hope you're enjoying this. I'm finding it pretty interesting as we learn about the game together. Um, I will try to get this next video out soon. Uh, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the gameplay. That is the heart and soul of this Let's Play. But every, every good Let's Play with a good manual needs a, a good reading beforehand. So we're paying our dues here. I uh, will see you in the next one. Much love, peace, and joy, guys. Take care of each other. So long.